Thank you for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming Lydia Betts. Thank you, Jasmine, and thank you to everybody who came out this morning on this incredibly and sort of unexpectedly dreary day. Because it was so beautiful this weekend, it's hard to believe it was so awful. Um, as in this series, you've already heard uh, Helen speak about Van Gogh's works on paper, his drawings, um, prints, gouaches, watercolors. Last week, Katie spoke about um, the importance of his paintings and where they uh, fit into the progression of art, particularly in France, before and after Impressionism. And Katie also used her lecture to touch on some of the more theoretical aspects as to why Van Gogh um, was so different from his peers and what made his art so exceptional for the time. Today, since I am a conservator and not an art historian, um, we are going to go down to not really the microscopic level of what makes Van Gogh's art so interesting and so exceptional, but fairly close to it. Um, we uh, know that Van Gogh's materials in many ways were actually quite traditional. However, the ways in which, in which he used those materials are what um, makes his work so instantly recognizable. Uh, and um, I should say also that I'm taking my cue from Katie, and I am not going to say his last name at all because I just, I can't do it. I have tried and tried, and I just can't do it. I don't have that thing uh, available. So I'm just going to call him Vincent, just as Katie did. Here at the MFA, we are fortunate to have six paintings by Vincent that cover almost the entire range of his painting career, um, minus the period when he was in Paris in 1886 to 1887. Um, moving, I mean, I'm sure many of you know these paintings intimately, but starting in the upper left corner, we have the Weaver from 1884, the Postmaster Joseph uh, Roulin from 1888, then we have his wife, Madame Roulin, or La Berceuse, from 1889, the Ravine of 1889, the Enclosed Fields with Plowman, also from 1889, and finally, the Houses at Auvers from the end of, towards the end of his life from 1890. Today, I'll be using, as a framework, using all six of these paintings as a way to illustrate different points of, about Van Gogh's working process and his materials. As I'm sure most of you know, a traditional oil and canvas painting from the 19th century was composed of a piece of fabric, usually most likely made out of linen because it was the strongest type of fabric available at the time which was attached to some kind of structural support, such as a wooden stretcher or strainer with wooden tacks. This might be the final stretching because in, in many instances, artists would take their canvases out in the field and attach them to a temporary strainer or a working strainer and then restretch them back in their studios for a more finished and final presentation. This fabric, the linen, would have been sized first with a layer of some kind of animal skin glue. And this process served to isolate the linen fibers from the layers of material that would go on top of it. While linen is structurally quite strong, the oil and other materials that would have been mixed into the paint could damage the fiber over time, and artists had known this for centuries. So this layer of sizing would have been placed on the fabric. On top of that would have been spread multiple, most likely multiple layers of a ground, or sometimes called the preparation layer, the priming layer, that in general was pigments, traditionally lead white, mixed with linseed oil or other oils. <laughs> 
These layers after each application would be sanded and smoothed before the next application. Many artists wanted their ground layers to be incredibly smooth so that there was no trace of the fabric. There were, however, other artists who really wanted the feeling of the uh, canvas underneath and often chose not just the sort of plain weave that you think of, but other weaves such as a twill weave to give them some texture to work with in their paintings. Um, once the preparation was ready, uh, the paint layers would have been applied with oil. Um, a, there were additives that artists would sometimes use in their paints. They could add some varnish to the oil paint. They could thin it with spirits. Um, there are instances of artists adding wax or other products such as this material called McGilp that was uh, popular for a while in the 19th century to build up more impasto in their paintings. But we know pretty much that Vincent actually stuck with pure oil paint. And in the final step in a painting, um, would have been possibly the addition of a varnish coat added to the surface. So since I plan to describe Vincent's working, uh, his materials and his working process, starting from that very bottom layer, um, I show you here uh, an illustration that helps, uh, discuss, helps me discuss his uh, fabric supports. Um, the, the process of priming canvas, of stretching canvas, was uh, laborious and time-consuming. So by the 19th century, most artists were, in fact, no longer doing this work themselves. And many of them did not have studio assistants that they could pass the job off to either. So they would prefer to purchase it prepared from an artist colorman, as the color shops were known then. And here on the left, you see a diagram in French of the standard sizes available for artists at the time. And they all had these numbers here so that artists could request a canvas size by that particular number. And although this diagram is in French, it would have been standard for artists, colormen all across the continent and in England. One of the nice things about having these standard sizes was that it made it much more economical for artists, um, and particularly if they bought a, a bolt of fabric, they could figure out quite easily how many of those standard sizes they could fit on there. The stretchers and the strainers would also come in those standard sizes. And at the end of the working process, the frames would also come in standard sizes. So it made the whole process both easier and more economical. We know a great uh, deal about Vincent's preferences in materials um, and also his seemingly insatiable and endless need for more materials because of the letters that he wrote to his brother Theo. When he lived in urban areas such as Paris, he could easily purchase what he needed from any number of colorman's shops. But when he was in rural areas in Holland or later when he was in the south of France in Arles, it was much more difficult both to find a good colorman and to get exactly the kind of materials that he required. So he would order those materials through his brother Theo um, from afar. And, uh, Given how expensive artist materials were and how dependent he was on his brother to finance his career, he was very careful to um, save and use every bit of fabric or paint or um, brushes, anything that he could. Uh, on the right here, you see a reconstruction, um, an imagination of how 
one single bolt of fabric that Vincent would have ordered was used um, and divided up. These are the double square paintings that Katie mentioned, discussed last week that he made towards the very end of his life where they were literally an unusual format of two, the size of two squares placed side by side. Um, and as you can see, these paintings are all laid out as we believe that they would have, uh, that Vincent would have used the fabric. Um, there is a computer program now that has been developed by researchers whereby they can take a very, very high resolution scan of x-rays of paintings and with this program analyze the, um, the width and thickness and irregularities of the threads in the paintings and by um, putting them together, they can figure out where on a piece of fabric in the paint, each painting would have come in relation to the others. And this, it's so complicated that most people don't even understand what they're getting at. But it has become very useful for both scholars and conservators to figure out uh, within an artist's body of work where a certain painting might fall, if it has a companion piece, and it can even help in um, the authentic authentication process for an artist's work because if the fabric is so different from standard materials that that artist would have used, it does raise a red flag. In this next image, I show uh, here on the left uh, the reverse of this painting of Daubigny's garden from 1890. And I love this image. Um, it's it, because it's so um, unusual for, very, for several different reasons. Uh, first and foremost is the fact that the painting has not been lined or glued onto another piece of fabric. Um, the lining of paintings onto another piece of fabric or sometimes even onto a solid support such as a wood panel or even in modern times onto aluminum panels has been a traditional technique uh, for centuries and done usually to help preserve the painting. As time goes by, the linen is weakened from the movement as it changes with uh, the temperature or the relative humidity. It might be torn or otherwise damaged as it uh, lives in people's houses or travels or undergoes any kind of uh, potentially dangerous process. Um, I have seen things that have had baseballs go through them or have fallen onto lamp finials. So. There's no end to the paintings, the, the trouble paintings can get into. Um, however, when a painting is lined onto a new support, one of the crucial things that you lose is whatever information might be found on the original reverse of the painting. This could include a canvas stamp, an inscription, um, information, uh, dealers, stamps, all kinds of things. And in many cases, the, all of that information was not documented before the painting was lined, so it is now lost. Here you also see a very traditional stretcher. It has four members here. It's a stretcher, which means that its corners are expandable as opposed to a strainer where all the corners are fixed. And this is preferable because, as you can see, with these little wedges called keys in the corner, as the painting would sort of lose its tension and maybe sag a little bit over time, and I think we've all had linen pants that do that at the knees, the wedges can be pushed out with a little tack hammer. And so, as the stretcher enlarges, it helps to maintain the fabric at the proper tension. Um, the other reason why I really love this image is that you see all of these labels 
that are attached to the stretcher. And although they're impossible to read right now, one of the beauties of things like that is it really tells a story. It tells the history of the painting, where it might have been exhibited, who owned it, um, whether it had traveled. And as we know from some of uh, our other um, works in the collection, it can also tell us important things about the painting's provenance and whether or not uh, it might have been Ill, uh, obtained illegally. Um, so these sorts of details on a stretcher are very important. Uh, it's also, obviously, the thing that makes it interesting is the type of fabric that was used. And if you see these red stripes here, they look just like this traditional French dish towel, otherwise known as a torchon. For the most part, um, uh, at this point in his career, in 1890, Vincent was financially better off and didn't necessarily need to reuse materials, but this happened to have been painted at a time when, for whatever reason, his brother had been slow to send him the materials that he had asked for, and in his need to keep painting, he obviously grabbed whatever was at hand, and that happened to be a dish towel. We know that um, even in his earlier times, Vincent struggled with being able to have enough materials to satisfy his creativity and his needs to keep uh, painting, so that in his early days in Holland, it was somewhat common for him to reuse canvases. Um, and also he did that uh, possibly even a little bit more frequently when he was actually living in Paris. Typically, with those canvases, he would scrape down the paint that was already on the surface and possibly even apply a layer of a single color on top of that so that the previous composition would be blotted out by um, this new layer so that he could be free to pursue a new painting without the distraction of the previous one, composition underneath. Um, the MFA is very lucky to have a very dramatic example of this reuse of his canvas. In May and June of 1889, Vincent undertook a series of landscape paintings, um, including, as you can see here, in particular, the very famous Starry Night. For each of the paintings uh, that he was making, Van Gogh, Vincent sent um, a very detailed, beautiful drawing of that composition to his brother in Paris. And um, I show this diagram that was put together by my colleague, Meta Siobhan, who was here uh, years ago in a Mellon Fellowship, and did, uh, must credit her for doing all of the research on this particular project. Um, there is one gaping hole in this diagram, and, you know, helpfully there's a question mark there to point that out. And this is for the drawing of wild vegetation uh, in the uh, collection of the Van Gogh Museum. For years, scholars had searched for the location of the missing painting. They worried that it had been lost, damaged somehow, and it was uh, never found. In 2007, uh, we happened to, the MFA was participating in a research project along with scholars from uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art in conjunction with the exhibition uh, Van Gogh's Repetitions. Um, because our painting of the ravine was being um, examined to determine if it were the first or second uh, version of uh, the painting, uh, Meta was asked to take a new x-ray of the ravine as you see here, um, because she was incredibly skilled at taking x-rays. 
And the original x-ray was old and also not in a digital format, which made it harder to compare um, and to do overlays and other things to compare the two versions of the painting. The x-ray that emerged from this experiment was completely unexpected. And as you can see, bears absolutely no resemblance to the painting that currently sits on uh, the surface. This uh, crazy series of all these little circles all over the place, um, there is no hint of that in the composition of the ravine. And interestingly enough, you also do not see any, really, of the composition of the ravine showing up in the x-ray. So clearly, the pigments used in the x-ray here were much more opaque to, uh, to the energy of an x-ray, meaning they had heavier metal pigments, such as lead or um, any of the cadmiums or things like that, that would block the x-ray and render the, um, uh, it appear, its appearance like this. Um, so fortunately, Meta at the time, uh, she is a Dutch citizen and happened to be visiting friends and colleagues in Holland at the time and showed this x-ray to uh, a curator at the Van Gogh Museum who immediately recognized the composition <laughs> as that of the wild vegetation. So here are the drawing and the x-ray side by side. And you can see how even these mountains up here, as just sketched in as they are, you see the shape up there. And all of this movement of the circles is all translated into paint here. And you see this area that appears darker there, and it is darker as correspondingly over here in the x-ray. It does seem kind of incredible to us that no one had ever made this connection before, as scholars had long known that there was some kind of composition underneath the current one. And also, with the naked eye, even, in the galleries, you can tell that there is something else going on under the upper layers of paint. This is a photomicrograph uh, taken of a section in the upper left corner of the painting at high magnification, just to give you a sense of this pink color. And it doesn't read pink partly because of the color of the light element of the, under the microscope. But you can see how there is this different layer underneath these very liquid yellow, uh, blue, and green strokes on top of it. However, even with the naked eye, as I said, in the galleries, and, and I should say, I, I took these pictures in the gallery with my iPhone. <laughs> so uh, it's very impressive what you can do with an iPhone. Uh, you can see, for example, a yellow swirl that shows through underneath the paint strokes drawn diagonally across it. And even where the strokes below are fully covered up, down here you can see sort of the ghost shapes of all of those circles coming through the upper layers of paint. Um, and here, although these are in fact harder to see, there are these little pink elements that poke through uh, the original composition, the uppermost composition, and we know that the predominant colors of the flowers in wild vegetation were pink and yellow. And so we can easily see those in there. And I urge you to go uh, upstairs and look at the painting yourself to see this. And I should just say that, as an aside, I took my then five-year-old daughter to see it. And I said, you know, there's another painting underneath it. And she walked right up to the wall and laid her head against the fabric up there and tried to look behind the painting because she <laughs> so didn't understand the concept of artists painting one layer on top of the other. Returning to our discussion of Vincent's materials, um, we should next consider briefly the ground or preparation layer. 
Um, as I mentioned before, artists in the 19th century typically no longer prepared their own canvases, except in exceptional circumstances. And his letters to his brother all confirmed that he purchased his canvas already primed. Um, this one exception, once again, shows uh, that Vincent would occasionally prepare his own canvas. And part of how we know this is prepared by hand and not commercially is because of the way the ground shows through on the reverse. And the action of scraping the ground down to smooth it out would push it through the fabric onto the reverse. And you often see that on artists' painting. He preferred a white or a cream-colored ground, although every once in a while he would apply an overall top layer, an imprimatur layer, of a color on top of the white or cream ground in order to work on some effect he was um, uh, aiming for. One notable thought, uh, fact about Vincent's preparatory layers is the way that he, like many of the Impressionists and artists ever since, incorporated the tone of the ground layer into the composition itself. And as you see here with the enclosed field with Plowman um, from 1889, uh, here, down here you see the ground acting as a lighter layer poking out between these cut off stalks there. You see how it shows up in the sky and can read as a white streak. Um, this detail also shows how Vincent clearly felt no compunction to completely fill the canvas all the way to the edges. All along the sides here, you see exposed canvas there as well in areas down there. Um, and he just used that as part of, uh, particularly successfully in the sky. And down here, you can see there are these dabs of color, but then these areas of ground mimic um, the same shape. So he could very easily use those tones uh, as part of his composition. Um, one of the things that would, in many cases, come next in the creation of a painting would be the application of some kind of underdrawing to the canvas, maybe in charcoal, pencil, uh, an underpainting with a very thin wash of some kind of color. We know um, that early in his career, when he was just starting to paint, Vincent would sketch in figures in charcoal and then try and fill in those outlines with his paint. But he found this process very unsatisfactory, partly because as he went along, he lost the drawing through the application of paint. And certainly once he began painting in earnest and after he moved to Paris, he really abandoned the underdrawing technique as far as we know. Um, late in his life when he was making those copies of works by famous painters, his copies of Millet's works and others, he would use um, a method to a uh, grid to transfer the drawing because he wanted to be as accurate as he possibly could in copying the composition of those already known works. But in his own works, we don't find that he did that particularly often. Uh, and it should be noted that with something like charcoal, because of the thickness of the paint that uh, Vincent normally applied to his paintings, it would be very difficult for us to find any signs of that underdrawing uh, on the canvas, because in particular, examining things with infrared, uh, which is our standard technology for looking for underdrawing, it would not show through that, those pigments. Uh, as you heard before, uh, it took Vincent quite some time to kind of gather up the courage after he had started his training as an artist to begin painting in oils. Uh, and it was really working with Anton Mauva, who 
really encouraged him to start painting that got him to finally venture into oil painting in 1881. Um, his earliest oil paintings are quite traditional in technique. Malva had trained traditionally. He passed on a lot of this knowledge to Vincent. And um, so there isn't really anything particularly unusual that you would say about his earliest paintings. Here in uh, The Weaver of 1884, um, you can see that he was using uh, a very rich medium. You can see that the strokes here in particular are quite fluid. Um, there's a lot of blending of the paint and smoothing of the paint that goes on in the background, and I think the x-ray helps to reinforce this idea. Particularly, you can kind of see almost sort of tide lines of around the brush strokes here uh, delineating the floorboards um, because the, there would have been enough of a medium so that they, it was quite liquid. And also a lot of scumbling and blending here in the background. His paintings in the early 1880s had a very limited palette. And as you see in this sketch of his palette that he had in one of his letters to his brother, he was content with a very simple palette composed of lead white, Naples yellow, yellow ochre, red ochre, burnt sienna, raw sienna, either a cobalt or a Prussian blue, ivory black, and vermilion. He felt that he could achieve any of the other tones that he might want, such as a green or a purple, through the mixture of those tones already on his palette. Occasionally, he would write to his brother and ask for a random tube of some brighter color, uh, possibly an alizarin red, or even occasionally a tube of ultramarine. But ultramarine in particular was incredibly expensive, and he was so conscious of what Theo was spending to send him these materials that he really didn't want to in include those more extravagant and expensive pigments. Um, this very restricted palette explains why his most famous work from that time, The Potato Eaters of 1885, is so dark and to our modern eyes appears almost monochromatic. However, um, even in all of its gloom, Vincent was experimenting with the theories about color that he had been studying. And as Katie described, Vincent was constantly reading and studying and and willing to soak up any ideas that he could get a hold of. I show here just briefly two color wheels from some of the more prominent color theorists of the time. On the left is Chevreux's color wheel. On the right, the color wheel that appeared in Charles Blanc's book on color theory. What most fascinated Vincent about these ideas about color theory part of which had come through breakthroughs in the science of optics in the 19th century, um, was this idea of what was called the law of simultaneous contrasts, which stated that when the primary colors, your red, your blue, and your yellow, were placed alongside or near the secondary colors, the orange, the green, and the violet, that they would produce a kind of optical vibration and reinforce each other and make each other more vivid. It's a little hard to imagine that that's the kind of theory that Van Gogh was studying while he was creating dark paintings like the potato eaters. However, um, when he wrote to Theo and described this painting, he talked about a lot about how for example, the red of the woman's cheek here would be set off and vibrating against the green of the jacket or the greenish tonalities of the earth pigments so that there would still be some play of these colors just on a very muted uh, and dark 
scale. It was indeed Van Gogh's, Vincent's trip to Amsterdam in 1885 that really opened up his mind and his eyes to the possibility of color. Um, he was especially struck, as has been mentioned before, by the vibrancies of the contrast of blues and oranges that you see here in this orange versus the blue background, and in particular here, that blue sash against that orange jacket um, that you see in these paintings by Franz Hals. Um, it's also uh, possible to see um, with Hals the kind of brush strokes, the, the strong um, individual brush strokes that Hals used and the kind of effect that they would have, uh, how they would strike Vincent when he saw these paintings. On his return from that trip, the effect on his painting was almost immediate, as you can see in these two comparisons. Um, the cottage here from 1885 was painted not long before his trip to Amsterdam, and the Avenue of Poplars uh, was painted quite soon after his return. And although he isn't immediately exploding into the brilliant color that we are more familiar with in his paintings, you do see suddenly um, these passages of these sp spots of bright red, the blue strokes in the sky versus the orange strokes in the trees. Uh, there is still black and brown and earth tones, but nothing like the sort of muddy and muted tonality of the earlier paintings. You also see um, the, the use of these more individual brush strokes, how he was more comfortable separating the brush strokes and not blending them in together, whereas up here you see much more blending of the strokes in the sky. There is some hatching there, but not nearly as much as you see in the lively and vibrant brush strokes of the Avenue of Poplars. In 1886, Vincent rather abruptly decided to move to Paris and went to live with his brother Theo. Impressionism was uh, in full bloom at the time, and um, artists such as Monet, Manet, and Degas had all made their mark on the art scene. And th at the time, there were also new artists such as Seurat and Signac who were introducing new styles, uh, neo-impressionism, pointillism. And I show these examples from our collection because they're artists that uh, Van Gogh, that Vincent would have met, um, that he would have become, in the case of Toulouse-Lautrec, become very good friends with. And these are works created more or less around the same time as Vincent, uh, Vincent's arrival in Paris. Um, as you can see from these examples, the typical palette of the Impressionists um, contained very few of the darker pigments, the earth tones um, that Vincent was still including in his paintings and was quite uh, fond of. And you see um, here, uh, the contrast of the oranges with the blues, the greens and the reds, um, that was a hallmark particularly of the um, paintings of Monet and the other Impressionists. Uh, and one other thing that was important for Vincent to see in these works was the matte surface quality of the painters, the paintings that he would have seen in Paris. Um, even though the Degas here is a pastel, that kind of more matte surface was increasingly important to artists at the time. As you see in this illustration, uh, the typical palette of the Impressionists at the time um, was much brighter and more pure than had been in the past. And this slide is a little deceptive because the squares painted out look much darker than they are, but the only real dark pigment here 
is the ivory black down here in the corner. Um, research and analysis on Impressionist paintings show that this is quite typical of uh, the types of paints that uh, artists would use. The lead white and the zinc white, um, chrome yellows of various hues, cadmium yellow had also become available at the time, Naples yellow, alizarin crimson, um, the natural matters there, and then um, you would have uh, vermilion and another orange chrome pigment. For the greens, there were um, the Sheeler's green, um, the, the uh, emerald green, uh, viridian, chrome green, and many of these were also new pigments because chrome had been uh, discovered by, in the chemical industry and so had emerald, which um, was an arsenic-based pigment. Um, down at the bottom, you find, for the blues, you find uh, cerulean blue, which is a cobalt pigment, uh, pure cobalt, and then the artificial ultramarine. But even though it was an artificial pigment, it was still more expensive than, uh, the, certainly, than the cobalt pigments were. In Paris, Vincent soaked up really everything he could from the art world. He visited museums and galleries. He took classes in the studio of an artist named Fernand Cormont and became friends with such artists as uh, Toulouse-Lautrec and Emile Bernard. Uh, he certainly wasn't about to call himself an Impressionist at that time and initially wasn't even sure he particularly liked Impressionist paintings. Um, the effects on his paintings were uh, just of from having been in that environment and seeing that art were very clear. The MFA, as I mentioned before, unfortunately doesn't have a painting from that period. So um, I am showing here an example um, from the Van Gogh Museum, the Banks of the Seine from 1887 on the bottom. And here at the top is one of our Cicely's from 1884. And you can see how much has changed for Vincent. The, the kind of, the sharp perspective of the uh, landscape, maybe betraying a little bit of the influence of Japanese art and their use of very uh, strong and unusual perspectives. Um, and in particular, the uh, use of the strong strokes of complementary colors. And you can see, these pure blues down here, the pure oranges, and how the reflection is so differentiated from the water itself there. The red of the fence there contrasting against the strokes of green in the trees. Um, Vincent's fascination with the use of these strokes of complementary colors uh, was such that he even went so far as to purchase uh, these balls of wool, and um, or skeins of wool, that he would organize both in balls of pure color, as you see there, these pure orange tones, and then he would also take strands of the yarn from the skeins and wind them together to study the effects, for example, of the blue against the orange there. And I have to say, this is just one of the my favorite things about Vincent van Gogh, that he would have this box filled with yarn. I love this. Um, this came down through his family and is housed at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. This next image, the red cabbage and onions, is almost as if you took those balls of yarn and just glued them to a canvas. You see just, oops. Um, you see the individual strokes and, and how they almost, as he uses the strokes to describe the shape of the cabbages and the onions, it really does kind of look like a ball of wool because they're so individual, each of those strokes. And once again, the, the contrast of 
the orange with the green, the blue and the red, um, and even in the shadows there, you see the purple strokes against the blues. You see him working all the time to um, see what effect he could get from the placement of these colors next to each other. Um, and this effect is also, of course, enhanced by the brushwork itself. And you see areas up here where you can, you can just sense the movement of his hand with the brush as he made those strokes, both vertically and horizontally, with a wet paint over what was most likely a dry paint because those strokes are so um, individual. And of course, it is the handling of paint, those brush strokes that Vincent uh, is so famous for. I, oops. I love this picture of one of his palettes, also in the collection of the Van Gogh Museum, because you see so much of what happened, what ended up on the paint, uh, on the canvas, started off on his palette. Um, you can see how he dug into the thick paint that he would have applied to his palette with his brush and moved it around here. There is some blending of colors that is on mixed into those strokes, but often it is just simply a pure color there. Um, and it's a perfect illustration as well of those complementary colors. The greens playing against the reds, the blue here mixed contrasting with the yellow. Um, it's almost a complete composition in itself, this palette. Um, as far as we know uh, from analysis that has been done on many of his paintings, Vincent used basically just the oil medium for his paints, um, and he might have used some spirits, some turpentine to thin it when he felt that was necessary, but he didn't tend to add other bulking agents or McGill or things like that to his paint. Under the influence of his friend Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, he did experiment briefly uh, while he was in Paris with a technique called peinture à l'essence, which means that the paints were drained of as much of their oil as possible and then thinned down to a great degree with turpentine. It would give it an incredibly matte appearance and thinking of the work of Toulouse-Lautrec, that makes absolute sense because his paintings are very matte and chalky in appearance. And here in the still life with lemons, you can see just how, I mean, it really almost looks like a gouache, uh, even though it is an oil painting because it is so dry, except for a few somewhat juicier strokes of paint right there in the bowl and in certain areas. But certainly in the areas delineating uh, the lemons, it's, it's almost like a watercolor technique there. Um, however, this experiment did not seem to work out particularly well. Not, it's not that it didn't work out well, I just don't think Vincent was particularly interested in pursuing this avenue. And in this next example, um, the portrait of Joseph Roulin, also known as the Postman, from 1888, shows us many of the different ways that Vincent could and did apply paint to canvas. Um, in the background, for example, you see uh, mostly quite flat color, but looking closely, there is a grid pattern, almost, a sort of a uh, woven pattern that he frequently did when applying larger areas of uh, a mostly flat color where there was no design or uh, pattern to distract the eye. Here in these details, uh, you can also see, for example, here in this detail of his knee, 
you see the brush work is, the paint is fairly thin. And um, so you get some sense of the ground or else the background color poking through the blue paint, paint there. It's also fairly unmodulated and fairly flat. He didn't create the form through using different shades of the blue, but rather used these much darker strokes of a pure dark blue to draw, really essentially draw on the form. In this detail around the hand up here, once again, you see these quite thin washy strokes of the green there on the, in the shadowy areas of the table. And then a much thicker, wetter paint used uh, on the table top. And again, as down here, these very strong outlines of dark color to create the form. With the hand here, you, you get a sense of him building up the form of the hand with the different strokes laid on top of each other. And this highlight you see of the pinky is just one long stroke that goes along the top of the hand. The shadows, once again, often done towards the end of the painting process of that hand, because as you can see, it goes over the already dried paint. Um, these darker colors used to create delineate the shadows. And then finally, some of the highlights up here also applied um, after the paint had been dry. And of course, if you look closely at his beard, um, there are so many strokes of complementary colors. It's almost as if there's this sort of furry thing on his face because it's so vivid and seems to be moving and you see uh, once again, you know, the orange strokes and the green strokes and the green and orange constantly playing off each other, even if in this instance they are um, more muted because obviously in this instance he was making a portrait of a friend and did not want to give him a pure orange and green beard. And finally, you can see how in the face he uses these rich strokes of color to block in the form. And that stroke showing the tip of the postman's nose there. And then these very dry, sharp strokes for the eyebrow up there. Um, from the following year, we have our portrait of uh, Madame Roulin, the postman's wife. Uh, also known as La Berceuse. And here you see um, even more uh, play of the contrasting colors. You have the bright green of the skirt, which is quite thinly painted um, with a first layer with a sort of a blue, green, a cool, icy green color of, um, I believe it is Viridian mixed with white, with yellower, greener strokes laid in on top of it, contrasting unbelievably vibrantly with the red of the floor and the reddish tone of the chair. Um, you can uh, also see how it is repeated throughout the painting in the background as well. And in some of these details, um, you see, once again, from my iPhone, uh, you can see uh, how this smooth, thin green background, greenish blue background, is contrasted with these really strong dabs of orange red paint. And then these, finally, these circles of blue added all over. Uh, Vincent even carried out the, the play of the contrast of the red and green here in um, Madame Roulin's eyeball. Artists traditionally with portraits, I'm sure you've all noticed how in the corner of the eye, artists traditionally put a red spot um, to give it a very natural appearance because we all have that in the corners of our eyes. 
but you can see this very bright red and the contrast, uh, the sort of almost demonic contrast that it makes with the pure green of her iris there. Um, Vincent's use of color and the amount of paint in this painting really is quite extreme. The contrast between the flatness of the red floor compared to um, what you see in these details of her face where the paint just seems to be added layer after layer until it culminates in, in this crust almost of paint on her forehead and in parts of her hair. And over here you can see how originally much of the form was made with these uh, horizontal and diagonal strokes to kind of give a sense of the shape of the forehead. But in the final layers he drew these very thick strokes of almost pure color straight down across her forehead there. And um, they're quite uh, crusty. It's difficult to judge whether or not the full quality of this surface has been compromised over the year, many times in the lining process with paintings. The thickness and the three-dimensional quality of the impasto of paint can become flattened, uh, particularly in earlier centuries when there was a great deal of heat and uh, moisture used in the lining process, we do find instances where uh, the paint has been somewhat flattened by lining. Painting, uh, paint could also have been flattened by artists when they were transporting paintings, when the paint might have been somewhat wet and paintings were stacked on top of each other. We also see that occurring. So, it's not entirely possible to know if this is, in fact, the original appearance of um, Madame Roulin's forehead and, in fact, the rest of the impasto in the painting. But um, at least you get a very strong sense of the really three-dimensionality of the paint there. Our portrait of Madame Roulin also illustrates sort of the, the pleasures and the pitfalls of chemistry and what happened to artist materials in the 19th century. Um, there was an explosion of new materials being created uh, in the 19th century and in particular for artist materials growing out of the textile dyeing industry when they finally were able to make synthetic dyes that mimicked and actually often improved on the natural dyes that had been available beforehand. Many of the colors that we associate with uh, modern painters, with the Impressionists in particular, were new pigments at the time. The chrome-containing pigments, the cobalt-containing pigments, um, and the synthetic lake pigments, uh, such as geranium lake which was one of Vincent's absolute favorite tones. It was a very intense, rich red color. Um, however, it was known even at the time by artists that many of these pigments could potentially discolor over time. And the lake pigments in particular were known to be fugitive, but artists didn't seem to care and in fact, Vincent wrote to his brother uh, at one point saying that he had found a solution for how to prevent the geranium lake from fading. However, we know that that is not in fact the case. Some of these details from uh, Madame Roulin show the, these flowers uh, in the background. They are very pale pink. However, um, in this image, which you've seen before, of the comparison of the five versions of this painting, it is the Kruller Muller uh, version is believed to be the original, partly because of the free way in which the, paint, the flowers in the background were painted. In one of his letters, Vincent described them as bright pink dahlias. 
And as you can see in all five versions, the flowers range from a very pale pink to basically white, um, including uh, in ours. And we uh, did some uh, analysis, some microanalysis of the pigments in this painting, and we do find traces of the chemical eosin, which is the component of that geranium lake. So we can only assume that the painting would, in fact, have had these bright pink flowers playing off of that blue-green background. In this next example, uh, the bedroom, also from the Van Gogh Museum, um, shows is an illustration of an even more extreme problem with this fugitive geranium lake he loved so much. Vincent described this painting in great detail to both his brother and other family members because he painted uh, other versions of this painting to send to his family to show them what his bedroom looked like. Uh, as he wrote to Theo, he said, quote, this time it's simply my bedroom, but the color has to do the job here. And through its being simplified by giving a grander style to things, to be suggestive here of rest or of sleep in general. He then goes on in the letter to detail the colors used in various parts of the room. Among them, the walls are of a pale violet. The floor is of red tiles and the doors are lilac. Of course, looking at the painting now, where, where is the violet? Where are the red tiles and where are uh, the lilac doors? Uh, I should say that as conservators, we are frequently asked if we would ever consider reconstructing or replacing missing elements in a painting, especially when it comes to either faded or degraded pigments or glazes. And the answer is essentially almost always absolutely not. But thanks to the wonders of Photoshop, Uh, you can digitally alter an image to try and get, as the uh, researchers at the Van Gogh Museum did, to try and restore um, the painting to its original appearance. Um, you can see how the change in the color gives a very different feel to the room. Um, the, the red, that vibrant red floor, the contrast of the purple walls and the yellow bed. Um, it just, I, I personally don't find it particularly restful, but <laughs> maybe it was for Vincent. And I should say that with any of these reconstructions, without, say even, for example, a strip of the original unaltered paint along the edge, we have no real way of knowing how far to take these reconstructions. So it might have been this vibrant, or it might not have, but at least it gives you a sense of what has happened to many of his paintings over time. The final stage for an artist in working on a painting um, is uh, the application of some kind of a surface coating. Before the invention of the synthetic resins, the plastics, in the 20th century, artist choices for varnishes were basically limited to natural materials, tree resins and gums, um, mixed in with uh, spirits to dissolve them, or something such as egg white, which was used um, often as a temporary varnish. These gums and resins, they are secretions uh, of trees and insects. They often contain bits of tree or insect in them. They emerge from the tree already somewhat discolored and given the purity or lack of purity of solvents at that time, the varnish itself would never have been completely clear, would never have been crystal clear in the way we would expect it to be in this day and age. So artists knew well that applying a layer of varnish would already somewhat slightly alter their appearance. And everyone knew about the effects of um, the aging process and the yellowing of these resins over time. Um, Vincent, in his earlier years, and I show you once again the weaver from 1884, 
um, knew that darker, more oil-rich colors would turn matte or somewhat chalky in the darker areas of um, the painting and most likely varnished at least some of these earlier works. Uh, in one of his letters to Theo, he wrote that the paintings he was sending to Theo in Paris should be gone over, quote, with the white of an egg in about a week or some varnish in a month's time to lift them and to prevent those darks from going chalky or matte. In our example here of the weaver, you see how glossy the surface is. You see uh, with the darks here, how you can still make out the details. They are saturated, um, and the surface has a quite rich quality to it. Um, we are assuming that this is how Vincent would have wanted the surface to look, but we don't really know for sure. And it's important to note that this painting, um, like most paintings of a certain age, has probably been varnished, cleaned, and varnished again on multiple occasions. So what is currently on the surface uh, is very unlikely to have been Vincent's original varnish, but rather a, an interpretation done at the time of its application of what the conservator at the time would have thought the surface should look like. Like so many of the Impressionists and artists uh, afterwards, Vincent came to prefer a much more matte surface, um, which would be achieved by leaving the paint surface unvarnished after it was completed. Basically, from the time of his experiments with the peinture à l'essence, and those extremely matte, dry surfaces, Vincent chose to leave his surfaces free of varnish um, and was definitely opposed to the kinds of discoloration that a varnish on the surface would have given them. Uh, the problem for Vincent and for so many of the painters, particularly in that transitional time when artists were first stopping the use of varnish on their paintings was that dealers felt that the general public would not understand a painting that wasn't varnished or would not purchase, more importantly, a painting that hadn't been varnished and that didn't com conform to standards of appearance for paintings at the time. So even though some artists, uh, such as Pissarro, actually wrote on the back of their canvases, please do not varnish this picture, comma, see Pissarro, uh, dealers would go ahead and varnish them. So we, we struggle with the appearance of these paintings. Here now, you see our uh, Houses at Auvers, um, a very late uh, painting, 1890, close to the end of Vincent's life. And it's really a perfect example of how a varnish layer can alter a painting. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the very beautiful Van Gogh and Nature show at the Clark Art Institute out in Williamstown this summer. But this painting, given its late place in Van Gogh's um, career hung very close to the exit in a room with other landscapes. And um, it really stood out for me in that last room and not in a good way because when you looked at it, at it after having walked through an entire exhibition of Vincent's paintings and looking at the types of surfaces there, you, you couldn't help but be struck walking into that room by how glossy and almost gloopy, if that's even a word, uh, our painting looked in comparison to the other paintings. Um, and I know other people had also mentioned this, uh, this fact in, when seeing it in that exhibition. If you compare our houses at Auvers, here on the left, with a view of Auvers painted at the same time, you can see just how extremely different our painting looks from this. Um, 
I should say it's often very difficult to capture surface effects of saturation and varnish um, in a digital image projected onto a screen. And I have probably stacked the deck a little bit here by showing um, a very matte painting on the right. But I just wanted to reinforce the fact that our painting um, does not look how uh, it ought to look. It has had multiple layers of varnish applied to it over the years, including a synthetic uh, layer, which while it might be clear in color, often because it is essentially a plastic resin, can impart a certain plastic quality to the surface. Um, so uh, one thing, one last thing that I wanted to mention in relation to this very topic is that um, in the course of this coming year, my colleague Irene Conifal and I will actually be treating these two paintings, um, the enclosed field with Plowman and the houses at Auvier, in an attempt to try and return those paintings to something more closely approximating what we think should have been um, the original surface of uh, these paintings. We, um, we're not entirely sure, but there is a chance that we will carry out some of this work in the conservation and action space in gallery 208 on the second floor. So if that is in fact the case, we hope that you will um, come by and not knock on the glass, but you know, just at least observe us as we are working on them. Um, and I would really strongly encourage all, all of you to go up to the Impressionist Gallery when you have the chance to look at the three of our uh, Van Goghs currently hanging there. It's uh, Madame uh, La Berceuse, the Ravine, and... Um, thank you. <laughs> um, so, because I really feel that, you know, obviously no digital image uh, projected on a screen can give a sense of the richness and the liveliness of Van Gogh's surfaces. And it's something you really have to stand, um, not too close, because you'll get in trouble, but close enough to, to really fully appreciate um, how, Van, uh, how Vincent came to achieve those amazing effects that he had in his paintings. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. We ask that those of you that are leaving now, please do so quietly so we can proceed with the Q&A. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We'll bring the microphone to you. Um, when he's painting outside and he does the painting very quickly, how did he avoid getting mud? Because, you know, he didn't have time for colors to dry and then put something else on top of that. Um, there is, uh, there's a lot of debate about how much of the painting, uh, for any of the Impressionist artists really, how much of the painting was done actually outdoors and how much was done in the studio. Many artists would start a composition outdoors and finish it off in the studio precisely to avoid some of those problems. Um, oftentimes we do find uh, bits of stuff stuck in the paint layers. You will find twigs, you will find leaves um, because the paint was still so fresh while um, painting out there. I think the fact that Vincent uh, could also keep his strokes so separate helped to maintain the purity of the color while he was working. Um, and as you could see from the self-portrait uh, that I showed in my very first slide, he had a handful of brushes in there. And I imagine he would use uh, a separate one for each of the colors that he was using so as not to get those muddy tones. <laughs> 
At the beginning of the lecture, you talked about stretchers and strainers. And was he painting outdoors on stretched canvas? Or, and I'm looking at this painting with a little bit of the canvas um, showing. Or, or because I know in one of the letters it mentions that he sends them to Theo and he asks to have them all stretched and framed. And I was surprised to say stretched and framed because I, I had always thought he was painting on stretched canvas. I think many times um, he would temporarily stretch them to work outdoors, or there are some instances where you see holes in the canvases where he might have tacked it to um, either a frame or a board. Uh, then it, oftentimes he would, in fact, have to, if he did it himself, have to restretch it once he um, got it back to the studio. And we know in some of his paintings you see um, the impression of fabric on the wet impasto from other paintings. So that opens up the possibility that the canvas, while it was still wet, would have possibly not been on a full stretcher, which has a certain thickness to it, so that it wouldn't um, necessarily uh, have been able to touch another canvas. Um, we also see uh, holes and circles. Artists use spacers, sometimes corks and nails, to separate their wet canvases as they transported them. Um, so those could have been on boards or stretchers or strainers even um, while he was working outdoors. A strainer is the same shape as a stretcher, but it's just that the corners are nailed together so there's no ability to expand them in any way. Uh, at, at, at that time, when uh, artists would typically draw the picture on paper or, or, or vellum, and then they would, they would trace it onto their final surface on which they would paint. So is there evidence that Van Gogh did that? or? We have no evidence at all. There are some, um, some of his paintings where uh, you can see um, he would sometimes use a perspective frame that would have lines on it that would help him um, in the, both to under, better understand the perspective and to give him a framework for copying the composition. There are some paintings, particularly from the Paris era where you can see the, um, the outlines of that frame uh, coming through the paint because it's fairly thinly done. In the period after that, after he moves to the south of France, it's very difficult to um, know how he would transfer compositions, how he made his repetitions because um, they're clearly not traced because if you overlay, for example, the five figures of uh, Madame Roulin, they do not completely match up so that it, they wouldn't have been traced, but he must have used some means of uh, duplicating the composition there. We do know that um, he did use underdrawings for his copies of uh, the paintings by Millet and other artist that he made in the, I believe, 1890. Thank you. I, I was just wondering in these two paintings, if he didn't add that top layer of gloss, was, was it added by um, owners, dealers? I mean, how did, how did that layer it's, it, it, it's so hard, um, it's so hard to know. We, um, here at the MFA, we're actually quite blessed to have had a curator who, in the period of the, certainly starting in the 1940s, kept very complete records of uh, treatments um, so that anything that would have been treated at that time would have been well documented. Uh, but for things that either came into the collection before then, passed through many hands, it's it's really impossible to know when um, a surface coating might have been added or 
added and then removed and added again. So um, sometimes we can tell, for example, if it's a synthetic material that tells us that it was certainly absolutely not added in Vincent's lifetime. But other than that, it can be very difficult to get any sense of when that might have happened. Do we know the length of time it had taken Van Gogh to paint uh, one of his pieces? Um, you know, I think it varied quite considerably. There were paintings that he would write to Theo that he completed in a day. But um, other paintings, we know that he would take longer. He'd need time to allow the lower layers to dry. Um, you certainly get a sense from reading the letters that he and, you know, whatever it was that was the form of mental illness that he had, I think, led him to often work in, occasionally, in a quite frenzied fashion. So um, I think there's a really wide variety of lengths of time that it, it took him to create uh, his paintings. And he didn't tend to work on a very large scale, so that uh, I think that meant that he could make a lot more progress on his paintings faster because he wasn't trying to cover enormous um, yards, a whole lot of yardage of fabric. Uh, my question is, how have colors changed over time? Or what's, what's the thinking about that from what he would have used originally to what the paintings look like now? Well, we have the, the problem with the fading of the uh, lake pigments, and we find that actually in paintings going back centuries, because artists have always been aware of the fact that those uh, lake pigments are not uh, light fast. Um, there is uh, known, a known fact that some of the chrome, the yellow chrome pigments that he used, have discolored. It's difficult to gauge the extent of the discoloration, um, particularly in the sunflowers where you see um, uh, d variations in the yellow color and there is uh, you know, often um, some indication possibly along attacking margins or areas that have been covered up by the frame where you might see a slightly different tone. But since, for example, with those paintings, they are primarily painted with that chrome yellow, the amount of fading or discoloration in relation to the other parts of the painting is, is unknown, which is, I think, why people don't go crazy with the Photoshop and try and reconstruct uh, what those paintings in particular might have looked, at, looked like. How do you remove the surface varnish without damaging the underlying pigment? Well, um, for example, with the synthetic um, varnish that is on top, the top layer of the houses at Auvers, the solvents that will uh, solubilize a synthetic varnish do not uh, affect oil paint um, at, at all. And in general, artists were very careful that um, the materials, they knew that for the most part with a sound, healthy oil paint film that even the solvents used to remove a natural resin shouldn't, uh, if handled properly, affect the oil paint. This, it's a different story if, for example, artists actually mixed varnish in with their paints, which creates a very difficult and frightening uh, situation for the conservator <laughs> trying to deal with these things. Um, we also don't know the effects of previous treatments on these paintings. There, it, there can be times when the paint has been affected by a previous treatment and maybe 
is more sensitive um, to solvent than it might have been originally, so we have to be very, very careful um, and test, really test uh, the solvents and see what kind of effect we get, especially since um, the goal here, as it was, for example, with both the postman and his wife, where the varnish was removed and no varnish was replaced on the surface in an attempt to try and recreate more or less that original, more matte appearance, that is our aim here as well. Um, we need to proceed as cautiously as we can so that we leave the paint looking suitably matte, but intact and undamaged. So that is, um, that is the challenge that we have working with these two paintings. This will be our last question. Oh. Uh, how many layers do you think are on those paintings? And, and is it just me? Are you trained to see the varnish? Because I never noticed it. <laughs> oh, well, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, it's, with these two paintings, it's actually a, a, a very different situation because there is at least, most likely, on the houses at Auvers, either a full layer of remnants of uh, natural resin varnish, but on top of it, there is a synthetic varnish. With the enclosed field with plowmen, it is primarily a natural resin varnish that has turned quite yellow, quite discolored. Um, particularly in the valleys of the impostos where you see it, and that really kind of deadens the, um, the look of the brushwork. But um, I wish I could tell you that you could go quickly take a look at this and see that for yourself how kind of uh, overly glossy it looks, but since they're up in the conservation studio right now, I, 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 can't, I can't say that but look for them to look suitably matte uh, when they reappear in the galleries in, a, in about a year's time. Thank you. Thank you.